Hello and welcome to the Rev It Up podcast, helping entrepreneurs fill up their tanks, crank up the RPMs, and put the pedal to the metal until they cross that finish line. Hello, I'm Jess Tiffany. Ready, set, go. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, super excited to have uh, Corey here with us today. Uh, Corey Warfield. Um, so, hello. How are you doing today? Jess, I'm awesome. I am also, I could not be in a better mood because you doing a podcast makes so much sense. And anyone watching this probably knows this is episode number one. So everyone watching this is part of history. Yes. I'm very excited about this. So, but, uh, so I wanted to jump right in. Um, tell, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, um, and then also one thing that would kind of surprise us about you to learn. Cool. Well, I think this, this is somewhere around uh, podcast 250 for me. So I feel like there's nothing I haven't said, but um, it always, it, it always shocks people when they find out that I'm both a reggae artist and a freestyle rapper. So I'll start with that. I, nice. I can make up rap and, you know, on beat for hours at a time. I've, I've rapped next to artists like De La Soul and, you know, some of the bigger hip hop artists over the years. And that's something a lot of people that know me personally, you know, kind of love about me is I'll, I'll get on stage, I'll front up a band. I've got hundreds of original songs out there. Um, but a little bit about myself, 20, I guess, 21 years ago now, uh, I thought I would travel the country on my own. Um, didn't have much work ethic, didn't have much experience. I had dropped out of college some years prior and I, I'd, worked for a pharmaceutical company for a bit and done some software testing, but didn't really hit my stride. So I thought I'd travel the country and that, that wound me up um, as a very, very young homeless man uh, on, the, on the west coast of the country. And so I was homeless for about a year and a half, living in parks under bridges, asking people for scraps and for, for change. And um, when I was around 20 years old, I decided that wasn't for me. And, uh, you know, I'd kind of just been going through some soul searching, one could say, living in a garage with no plumbing. And uh, because it was a ski town where everyone else loved to ski or snowboard and, and, and get drunk every night and sleep in every morning, I couldn't afford to drink and I certainly couldn't afford to ski or snowboard. So I worked like crazy. I was the best dishwasher they'd ever had. I showed up early. I stayed late. I worked seven days a week. So I got, I got raises. I got promoted. I, I started busting tables, did a great job started waiting tables, did a great job, started uh, bartending and ended up running their bar program, got certified as a sommelier and started working down, uh, you know, the street to the nicer and nicer places and ended up at the high end steakhouse in that little ski town. And I was making six figures working about seven hours or seven, seven months out of the year, making a six figure income. And it was beautiful, right? So I went from living on the streets, not eating every day, uh, to living in a beautiful four bedroom house in the mountains with a kegerator, a pool table and all of that, right? Nice car. And uh, because restaurants are what kind of did that for me. And because I, I had received the certification as a sommelier, which back then was a kind of big deal. It just means you're a cork dork and know way too much about wine and onophile is another you know, Latin fancy word for, it put me in a situation where I was able to earn, earn a good living for 15 years in the restaurant industry, about 20 years total. Um, about five years ago, I realized that my, my career as a waiter had been frustrating for two reasons. Patrons, you know, diners absolutely suck. It's, it makes sense. They're hungry, right? When people are starving and, and you're trying to charge them a lot of money and you, you put alcohol in the mix, bad things can happen. But the, the worst thing is my schedule changed every day and I couldn't forecast when I'd be working, couldn't forecast how much I would make. Every day I wanted to be off, I'd find out at one in the afternoon I had to go in and vice versa. I really need to go on and make a couple bucks. They'd tell me to stay home. I had nothing to do and no money to do it with. So I finally realized data wasn't being, being used to properly staff in the restaurant industry. And just do I still have you? Can you still hear me? I can, yes. Okay. Did I go away for a minute? Um, no, it warbled a little bit, but it uh, didn't go away. So Perfect. Well, we will chalk that up to user error. We'll say we have great <laughs> Exception, but Corey mumbles and that's okay. But I realized that data wasn't being properly used to schedule in the restaurant industry and it wasn't being used to inform on-call shifts and it wasn't being used to help automate the scheduling process. So I did some research, realized that there was a real need for this. I, I went out and validated. I, I brought an MVP to the market that was well-received. And so I've now, you know, for five years, put together a team and 
I, I, I self-funded the first few years of the company and bootstrapped us to market and fairly recently were able to raise, you know, quite a bit of money and we continue. We're, we're, we're successfully in the middle of a multi-million dollar fundraise right now, which, you know, some of the opportunities require, you know, quite, quite a bit of, of resources on the front end for us, um, unintended. Uh, but so now we're weeks away from a, a brand new version of the software. I've got a CTO that's batted six for six with exits in his capacity at this stage. He's saying as his seventh and final will be the biggest. But it's been fun building a, a, a software and a tech team and uh, simultaneously mentoring about 20 other people, helping them start companies, raise money. Now, now we've had an exit um, you know, through, through that. Now working on my personal brand as well a bit. Um, so that, that's me in a nutshell. I've, I've come, come a long way. I feel like I've got a long ways yet to go. Wow. Very, very cool. A great story. And so um, a question about that is, so when you went from, you know, being uh, the, the waiter and all that stuff, and then all of a sudden now you have a team, how did you, uh, how did you learn how to manage that team and, and really uh, keep everything running smoothly? So that is a great question, but my answer won't help too many people because my answer is that I didn't. When when I was in leadership and when I was uh, when I I was tasked with uh, managing everything, things didn't go together so well. But I'd say the the one possibly the one smartest thing I did in my career was get an executive coach, and she basically identified pretty quickly that I wasn't delegating and that I didn't have a, an innate love for leadership. Uh, so we found some people that did. I, I hired a world-class CEO for my organization. He was the former director of technology for McDonald's. He's a big prospect of ours. Mm. Uh, I now sit, uh, I, I, I sit as the chairman of our board. I'm the majority shareholder of the, the company, but uh, I'm now tasked with being the chief visionary officer, which is exactly what I want to do. I get to have the ideas and, and have my leadership put the right pieces in place to execute on them. So um, I think how I was able to do it is by realizing I wasn't able to do it and then quickly putting pieces into place to, to compensate for that. Ah, very interesting. I, I think I struggle with that same issue. I, I'm kind of the, <laughs> I have all these great ideas and, and things, uh -huh. but, I, uh, but getting other people to help me, I'm kind of, I kind of want to, it's got, you kind of, I think you get a little bit of um, where it's kind of your baby and you're kind of like, Oh, I can't let anybody else touch it. They'll break it. You know? Um, but, um, but at the same time, realizing if you don't, you won't get it all done and your clients will be unhappy. And so, so you kind of have, kind of need to, uh, uh, let go a little bit and make sure you're getting people that can actually get the job done to have their hands on it so they can get it done in a good, uh, a fair time frame. So, um, so you, you that, that, de that delegation piece changed my life. Awesome. That's very, I think that's, that is very helpful actually for a lot of people out there to realize that uh, sometimes you got to let go to really rocket your company forward. So, um, so how did you, so as you were growing your company, I know you, you really transitioned to LinkedIn and really blew it up on LinkedIn. Um, kind of what got you going on LinkedIn originally? And then also, how did you go from like, say, maybe 10,000 up to 185,000 people? How, where did that, how did you make that transition into the mass acceleration on LinkedIn? Yeah, so it's now been, for, for a while, I was able to say, I'm, I'm brand new and I'm getting this growth. At this point, I've been on the platform for closer to two and a half years, I, I think now. So it's been some time. But I, I identified pretty early on that I wanted to establish myself as a thought leader on the platform. And uh, there was a lady at the time who's become a very dear friend and, you know, of, of mine and of Shedwell, but her name's Carrie Luxum. And at the time, she was one of the people that had more followers than most, and her posts were getting more engagement than most. And at a time where it was really unheard of to get, you know, 100 likes on, on a post, she was doing these daily little videos and getting at least 100 likes every time she threw the thing up. And I thought that was amazing. And she came from the restaurant industry, and she was an HR specialist. And um, so I, I said, if these videos are doing well and I want to be kind of aligned with her, I'll start to engage with her videos. Well, she, she, she kind of saw what I was doing quickly and she reached out and she said, looks like you're somebody that should be doing video as well. And so she convinced me to do a video or two. And for my first three months, I was doing videos and no one knew who I was. I still go back as an experiment. I had some people go back and find my first video on LinkedIn um, just some months ago, maybe six months ago. I'd, I probably just broke 100,000 followers. And they went back and that first video still had zero likes on it. 
Um, oh. Right, like literally, I, I would post. I think my best videos. Yeah, I think my best videos back there would get seven likes or something. I was stoked on that. Seven people liked my video. Um, but I, I knew I wanted to establish myself as that to look in my eyes, see my, my, my facial expressions, hear my inflection and my intonation. They started to get to know me and trust me a bit. And so I did start to grow. I was really, really fortunate to be in a wave of people that were just kind of all taking LinkedIn seriously at the same time and growing at the same time. And I think, you know, people thought I was growing pretty quick. And I, at the end of last year, end of 2019, I was in the 90s, of nine, 90,000s of followers and people thought that was pretty cool. And sometime in January, I broke 100,000 followers. But what I think is interesting is that, I, you know, I think on New Year's Eve, I probably had 97,000 followers. And today, I think I'll break 180, right? So I literally doubled. And so it took all this time to build up. But now I'm seeing, you know, I'll get between 500 and 2,000 people following my account every single day. And of course, you know, success leaves clues, but, but also haters mean you're on the right path. I have people that also unfollow me and block me all the time. And so through that lens, you can imagine that if I have people unfollowing me as well, and I'm still growing by an average of 1,200 people a day, you know, my, my account's kind of taking the light of its own. And I figured out to use a couple original hashtags, leverage those. And I think my, my biggest, I, I fell into this one. I felt really guilty that people were watching my videos and I wasn't watching any of theirs. And I would go through my feed and I'd, I'd give 20 people thumbs up on their videos, but frankly, I didn't watch any of them. And you know, at the time I didn't have a 30 person team and I didn't, you know, it, it was me, myself and, and, and my, my co-founder pretty much. And I, I didn't really have time to sit around and watch people's videos. I just didn't. I had time to give them a thumbs up and maybe say nice video and a comment. That was it. And I felt so guilty. I stopped doing videos and, I didn't do videos for a month or two and I, you know, life, life would have, should have been normal, but I had hundreds of people reaching out going, where are your videos? We miss you and this and that. And, you know, they were strangers and, and a couple of them were celebrities and one of them was a big time prospect of mine. And I'm going, nice. well, wait a minute, you know, if, if this guy and if these people like if they want to see my videos, I need to do the videos. But I, I had this moral dilemma because I knew I wasn't watching anybody else's videos. So I made a commitment. I said, what I'll do, I'll do my videos in 30 seconds because I can commit to watch anyone's video that's 30 seconds long. You know, it would take a hundred of those things to get to where I, I couldn't have time in a day. Um, and frankly, you know, even a year and a half after I started it, I don't think a hundred people are doing them a day. So it becomes very doable, right? But so mm. I started doing these 30 second videos. They went viral right off the, the bat. I think my, my first 30 second video probably got a hundred thousand views and a thousand likes or something. Wow. Um, but so I use this little hashtag value in 30. And back then it was unheard of for me. Um, so I just use this little value in 30 and these little 30 second videos. And it's, it's not a pitch. It's intended to be some type of a, a question or thought process or just some type of an emotion that others could benefit from as well. Right. Very, you know, at least fundamentally altruistic, but I've now had, you know, at least, at least in the many millions, if not over 10 million views on the value in thirties now, you know, tens of thousands of shares, a couple of hundred people on the platform have done them. And so it kind of created this whole little movement. And because people like to do 30 second videos and, and do the hashtag in 30, I'm kind of always given credit for those. And after maybe a month or two of doing them, I had a lady reach out and she's a wonderful lady named Meryl Evans. And she reached out and she said, looks like people are loving these videos of yours. Too bad I can't hear them because I, you know, I'm hearing impaired. Uh, if you would be so kind as to put subtitles on them that I could join in the, in the fun. She said, I'm assuming that you're a great guy with great things to say. And, and I'd love to know that. And, and so I messaged her personally and I said, I, that means a lot. I, I, that, that resonates with me. Uh, my, my grandmother in California, and, you know, she was a, a sign language interpreter for many years. And I don't want to ever leave anyone out. I, I'm a very inclusive person. So I started subtitling them. And there's a hashtag that she had turned me on to, which is this hashtag captioned. And if you do a video with captions on it and use that hashtag, everyone that's hearing impaired in the world will come find your video. Wow. So my 30 second videos are captioned. I, I have the support of the entire, you know, de deaf and hearing impaired community globally. It, it, you know, if you don't have those 30, 50 people that are going to come support you every time, uh, and I do, I'm going to have 30 to 50, you know, more likes or engagements on, on a very similar post. And so I think giving people these bite-sized nuggets, being that mindful to say, if you'll invest 30 seconds in my content that you've been asking for, I'll do the same for you. I, I, I will not, if someone uses that hashtag, or if I see a video that's 30 seconds with respect to them and our time, I'll, I'll invest that time in that anymore. And, you know, frankly, they're not all good, but some of them are much better than anything I've ever done. And 
at the end of the day, people really just seem to be kind of rallying around it. And, you know, I, I'm a big fan of doubling down. So when I found something that worked, doubled down on it, found something in there that, that really seemed to, to resonate and just take the ball and run with it. Awesome. That's, uh, I, I, I think you're going to end up watching a lot more of my, my 30 second videos that I'm going to start making now. <laughs> Perfect. That's, uh, I love that. I, 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 I really like that you uh, have the hash, use the hashtag caption too. Um, do you uh, use a software for that or do you ha have a contractor that does the captioning for you or how do you uh, uh, make that happen? So my team now spends a lot of money on different, you know, tools for the organization and that's, that's fine, I suppose. I'm a bootstrapper, so I'm not used to paying for anything ever. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, I've now gotten an assistant and all these, but I'm really used to just, I, what, what can I get without? And I, I love to barter. I, I love to give value for value. So I use a free software called Clips. Oh, Rev. Rev. There is a oh, what is it? learning fee. Um, it's only available for Apple, as, as I understand it. Oh, okay. No, it's called Cl it's called Clips. C L I P S. Okay. Uh, and it's very intuitive, very easy. It works for any Apple product. I, I believe there's a, a, a similar version uh, for Android. But I can tell you another another thing that works very well is YouTube. If you upload a video to YouTube, oh, they right. then have auto uh, captioning. Yep. And so you can turn that on. It'll, it'll be 90% correct. You'll have to go through and change a few words, but it's another easy free way. So I know there are paid ways and there are people on Fiverr that wish I wouldn't tell the world that there are free ways to do it because there are people and that's, you know, I don't say this to be you know, funny, but there are people that's how they feed their families and I don't mean to take money out of their mouths, but I'm just, I'm such a bootstrap rapper where, you know, if there's a free way to do something, you can pretty much guarantee I've tried yeah. it. Very cool. Um, now, I, uh, before we started, uh, you were telling me there was some new cool stuff you were doing, um, and, uh, and I'd really love to hear more about that, and I'm sure the audience would love to hear about that, too. Absolutely. So after putting a couple of years into building a personal brand and developing the social capital, uh, I put together a team to help me really leverage my personal brand, and I, I have my, my network came up with a hashtag for me. It's hashtag Corey Connects. I need to dig through and find out who gave that to me in a live video because uh, I owe them a lot. I think my, my book that I'm working on right now will be out soon. It's called The Human Side of Technology. I'm writing that with Chitralelli, and I'm really excited about that. But we're also working on a video game where you know people can live vicariously on LinkedIn as me uh, or learn how to level up on LinkedIn and, and get certifications and soft skills and meet recruiters and all kinds of fun things. I think I'm going to call that Corey Connects as well. Uh, if people follow the hashtag Corey Connects. I use that to make a couple uh, hundred intros a day, typically on the platform. Uh, and they've turned into some pretty, pretty wildly awesome things as well. Um, so I think the personal brand people have seen here a lot more of Corey Warfield coming through, you know, not just the book and the game, but, you know, different initiatives that I have. I'm always either teaching master classes, master courses, that kind of thing too. I've become that guy because when I'm on coaching, I love, but there's only one of me. Um, so if I can find ways to kind of impact more people at once, I'm all about that. So, you know, I, way, ways, the, my three words of the year were consideration, confidence, and collaboration. I take those very seriously in, in tandem, but I also just love delegating. I, I love, uh, I love seeing unification. So, you know, you'll find me in the middle of a lot of things. And, you know, this happens to be one with my personal brand where my name is very attached to it. I'm involved in some stuff where, you know, I'm happy to be in the shadows as well. But I think that's probably what you're referencing is the Corey Warfield brand coming to a theater soon near you. <laughs> Very exciting stuff. Uh, the book sounds really interesting. Is is there um, like a couple takeaways that you would say that people should really get out of that book? So what we're really looking at is prior to COVID, a lot of people were apprehensive of a lot of technologies, last mile delivery, online ordering, uh, video conferencing. And so how do we at this intersection really address the people that were scared to use these that now might either be loving it or hating it? Or how do, how do we position this as this doesn't have to be scary. You don't need to do everything online, um, but you can do X, Y, Z online. And if so, and if you like it, here's ways that you can even make it work more for you. Because I think right now people are really having that disconnect. It seems like, you know, a, a lesser evil sometimes, or it seems like the rest of the world is doing something. So you have to, and if we can really just unpack the fact that 
this is made by people for people. You know, not everything needs to be going in that, you know, robots will take over the world, artificial intelligence level, right? It, it can really be that, that we're leveraging, you know, connectivity and, you know, things of that nature to, to, to actually level up as humans rather than letting humans level up technology. So I think just really some level settings, hopefully some fear, some fear busting. And um, just my, my co-founder is a PhD in, in the tech space. She's amazing. And, you know, so taking it from kind of a, a high level tech genius like herself and then someone that had to look up what an API and, and SAS was, you know, a few years ago and I was starting my software company. I think she and I are, you know, we're almost the Laurel and Hardy of this space, but we complement each other really well. Nice. Very awesome. And, um, so, um, this is a question I had kind of come up with, but three tips to try to duplicate your success. Like if somebody's, uh, you know, kind of really getting their business, just going, starting out, uh, they're very focused on growing. Uh, what are three tips, uh, that, that would help them basically duplicate something like what you've done? So I, I love that question. I don't think I've actually ever been asked it just like that. And I think I've got the perfect answer in, in, in three steps. I think the first one is engage. Um, for me, it's the law of reciprocity. It, if you want to get 10 likes per post, like 10 posts before you post. If you want to get 100 likes on a post, go like 100 posts. It really is what you give is what you get, specifically if you're trying to do what I did on, on, on social media. If, I, if I've got 20,000, I know that would be silly. If I got 20 million uh, engagements on my content so far on LinkedIn, I've probably engaged 20 million times, literally. Maybe 18, you know, there, there are a couple of times <laughs> where the scales may have tipped, but really, you know, it should be about like for like. I mean, really, I've, I've worked really hard to get to where I am and it's, yeah. it's not, there's, there's no silver bullet with that one, but the more you engage, the more engagement you get always. And I've, I've taught hundreds of people that now and all of them have seen success. I think in addition to just law of reciprocity and engagement, number two on my list would be engage heavily with targeted influencers. Make sure that they resonate with you. Make sure there's someone that you would actually want to be on their team or that, that you're actually happy with, you know, kind of associating yourself with on a very real level. But And then be the best fan that they have never had. Be the best employee that they never hired. Become their cheerleader. You know, people like Bridget Hyatt and we're now friends and, and we have a mutual respect, but it's because I spent a long time trying to be the first person to like and comment on every one of her posts, sharing her concepts, buying her books, talking about her books, reviewing her books. And I think, you know, for people that think they're going to do it without necessarily leveraging an influencer, um, you know, I think that that can be really challenging for me, the way that I've kind of seen my rise and, and continue to do so is because I, I get love from, you know, some, some of the influencers now that, that show me love regularly or, you know, pretty, at least in certain circles, household names. But yeah. again, that didn't happen overnight. It was very strategic. And then the last one that I would say is a little bit more, we can call it spiritual or a little bit more, you know, warm and fuzzy. Uh, I don't know if it'll resonate with everyone, but through the lens of the first two being engagement and uh, engage an influencer, the third, and it works on LinkedIn, it works elsewhere, but, but it also transcends social media. And that's just to love more. And I think if people really understand what I just said and go and see the extent to which I love people on LinkedIn and on social media, that I think is the real secret. One thing to tell someone that you like their message, there's another message made you feel the love, right? There, there's one thing to, to endorse someone to write a recommendation and say that they were great to work with. There's another thing to say that you love their work and you are stoked to leave a recommendation. That little bit of extra passion and, and, and emotion to me that's love and is doing things in kindness, people notice. And the people that don't notice, they absorb it by osmosis. And it can be a smile. It can be a smile in your eyes. It can literally just be as simple as leaving a heart emoji at the end of your comment. But when people are showing more love, you get more love. And people are often blown away. They say, Corey, everyone loves you on LinkedIn. Or people show you so much love on LinkedIn. And it's like, yes. <laughs> and that was by design. It's, yeah. it's very intentional. It goes back to my number one law of, law of reciprocity. It's, you know, what, what you put out is what you get back. And so hopefully those put together are a, are a good blueprint for those watching the show. Wow. That's awesome. I was actually, that was my next question was, uh, uh, I noticed you did uh, like 140 recommendations and obviously you find value in giving out recommendations and, and blessing people with those because obviously when people come to their website or their LinkedIn profile, they see those recommendations um, and that builds credibility for them and their company and their brands. And obviously um, I could see that 
you're just showing them love and that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're giving to them um, something that's tangible for them uh, that helps them. And of course, then the spirit of reciprocity kicks in. And a lot of times uh, I, I imagine that leads to a lot of uh, uh, business and, and, and if nothing else, uh, it brings them to want to share your content with their audience. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think I've had three thousand. I think I've had three thousand shares of my posts in the last forty-five days. Oh it's wow! Bizarre. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, that's the power of of giving, and it's kind of like um, um, so with my with my book, uh, um, growth hacking strategically grow your business connections from zero to three or to ten thousand three hundred sixty-five days. Um, but basically, it's about um, a lot of it's you know um, you know about kind of what you said, just liking people, uh, building relationships, having good content, um, you know, and, and I always talk about, you know, who are your dream clients, your ideal clients, your people you want to employ over the next 10 to 15 years um, based on your business plan. Um, who are your mentors, your dream, the people you're, uh, that you, the influencers, um, you know, that you want to be associated with and, and relatable, related with. And that's who your audience is. That's who you kind of focus on. And, you know, and obviously you meet other people along the way and other people find you and that's great. And you can build great relationships there, but, but, um, but finding all those people, um, that's what I mean, like, uh, getting invited to, uh, uh I always talk about this, uh, but four time New York times bestselling author invites me to Sioux Falls, which is about four hours from where I live to go hang out for the day and, and at a whiskey tasting event. And I don't drink, but, uh, you know, per se, other than maybe some wine here and there, but, but I went down there so I could spend the day with him, you know, and, and other, um, you know, talking about nonprofits and connecting uh, a friend of mine that has a nonprofit that does military with a billionaire that has a, that does military nonprofit stuff and connecting them together. And then I get in the middle and I'm talking to the, you know, billionaire and it's like, that stuff doesn't happen, you know, much on other social media platforms, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty unique thing of LinkedIn and building relations. But again, you have to serve to, to, to get the, you know, so, so to reap, if that makes sense. So if you're sowing good seeds and, and nurturing to people, then you can receive on the other end. So I don't know, but anyway, I'm just agreeing with what you I'm, said, basically. I'm a, I'm a, well, and I'm a gardener. So that, that analogy definitely lands with me. Yes, I've seen uh, you have some good videos with you walking around your garden showing us stuff. So that's kind of cool. Um, well, fantastic. Well, I, I think we gave a lot of value today. I, uh, I, um, I'm very excited to share this with a lot of people. Um, any parting thoughts and where do we find you online? So uh, Corey Connects, C-O-R-Y Connects. Uh, is, is pretty universal across every platform now and my team is working at, at making it even more ambiguous uh, very soon so I think it, if someone were to type Corey Connects into you know obviously LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram but Google anywhere it should come up with a lot of resources. Um, I'm always maxed out on LinkedIn but I follow my followers back and I respond to every email so that people get the credit back and so that we're as good as, uh, as, good as connections. Um, as far as final thoughts uh, I hope that we had uh, a good enough chemistry and people love this enough that, that the crowds are uh, begging for me to come back and we can do a part two. But oh. other than that, I would just echo my point three to everyone. Love more, love your competitor, love your, uh, love, love your challenges more, love your wins more. It's just love more, put more love out there. And when you feel it coming back, it, you know, it becomes this snowball effect. And so I just, I love everyone watching this. Jess, I love you for having me. I'm really glad I had a great time catching up with you before. For the recording as well and i do need to run i've probably got another call starting in two minutes or less but uh <laughs> we will catch up and then guys ask for me back on the show i want to be a, i want to be a repeat guest here i'm sure you will be thank you so much we'll talk to you soon